After completing the Holy Grail that is the Klonoa Fantasy Reverie Collection this month as of writing, something has clearly dawned on me. All of the bosses in this game are kind of weird, like really weird. Don't get me wrong though, some of the bosses are actually pretty good, it's just that some of them feel more like an afterthought when the levels have more variety. So today we're going to rank all of these bosses from both the first and second games. Before we start however, I do have stuff I need to clarify. This is the most blatant one. Spoilers, these games are fantastic. So I suggest skipping out on this video if you want to check this collection out for yourself and avoid spoilers. Next, only the main bosses in the games are allowed, so the pseudo fights against Tad in the second game are disqualified because there aren't really bosses. Also, I will be using the Fantasy Reverie collection because it's my only way of accessing both games. So that aside, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> Mobile Tank Biscarsh? More like Mobile Stank Biscarsh. Jokes aside, this is not really a fun boss to deal with. What you gotta do is use the bounce pads to get high enough and fire your shot above its head. The problem is that it's really annoying to hit him. This thing's constantly over you and when you do go up you can risk getting your ammo popped. Also, it's annoying since sometimes the boss cannot just simply be in reach when you're airborne. On top of that, later in the fight, it sends missiles down on you. It's fine, really, because they're not that hard to avoid, but it's also a way that your ammo can be popped. Overall, this was an, an extremely annoying boss fight that I dread revisiting. I do like that this boss only existed solely so Leorna could finish her Walmart wind ring. Also, I find the chase sequence in the level afterwards a lot more fun than the actual fight. Mad C. Doff and Cursed Pamela focuses on a gimmick at grabbing one boss and throwing them at the other boss, which is a pretty creative idea, but the execution is pretty poopy, stinky, doo-doo fard. Not much is really done since there aren't many ways to grab him. Like, I could have sworn you could grab him while he was using Pamela to lunge at you. I could have sworn you could do that. The only way to really grab C. Doff is to get him when balancing on the spiked ball. Oh yeah, there are spiked balls all over the arena, and they're more of a nuisance than a challenge. It makes it more difficult to throw shots forward because you can actually do that. You can also throw shots to the side when Pamela lunges at you. The most annoying part is that sometimes Pamela will lunge at you if you can't grab seed off quickly enough. Pamela also launches bubbles, but they don't really do that much. Overall, a boss with a cool concept that falls really flat in execution. Rongolango, make sure you watch out for your back sauce. Rongolango is the first boss in Door to Phantom Isle, and also the first ever boss in the series, so fittingly, this is the easiest and most basic boss. Just pick up a Moo and chuck it right at his behind. Rinse and repeat four times and you win. However, there is some strategy to him. Lack thereof, honestly, but there is some. The game does want you to take time with hitting him, because Rongolango can turn around and jump, so you gotta watch where he is going and time your shot. You can also hit him when he is excrementing, excrementing the, the rainbow, rainbow circle. circle. It isn't like Biscarsh where it can turn into a waning game, so yeah, Rongolango is really easy and basic, but it does try to add some strategy with timing shots. Although it isn't enough to add more depth to the boss. Also, if you hit the bell in the background, it will ring and drop a health pickup. I just wanted to talk about how cool that actually is. That's really neat. Fulgaron is a lot like Rongolango, except with more depth. You have to face forward to hit the weak spot this time. Every time you do that, it'll spin around quickly so you can't chain hits. Like, you actually have to try in these games. You may have room to hit him again if you're in the right spot though, but that rarely happens. In the second phase, it will add its hands on the arena, and you will have to rely on flying moves. He is pretty easy once you have figured him out, but there is more depth to it. I really like the second phase, giving you more to watch out for. 
The first phase does do this as well, but it's not really anything to sneeze at. It's just a bunch of spiky, spinny things that all you gotta do is jump over to dodge it. But similar to Rongolengo, he is pretty easy once you get the timing down. I do, however, appreciate that they actually tried a teensy tip-tap more with this boss. My heart. I loved her. Palladium is a rather peculiar boss, despite how it becomes a huge turning point in the story. Mainly due to Joker killing Klonoa's grandpa and having Klonoa watch him die in his arms. Causing the story to slowly turn to a more mature storyline with more unexpected twists coming in later. Anyway, this boss has you on a swinging bridge, grab a flying moo on one side and hit Palladium on the other side. You also have to avoid its numerous attacks on its way. Those being pillars, bombs, these screw-looking missiles, it'll also throw in these bugs on the bridge to dash at you with. You can tell which attack you'll use by seeing the color on its wings. A pretty nice detail, actually. I say it's strange because despite the variety in its attacks, it can become an absolute joke in the difficulty department. This boss is supposed to have 8 hits, but due to the hitbox on this boss, you can beat it in 4 hits. No joke. My highest time attack score is 27 seconds. 27 seconds! This is actually a pretty unique boss that is bogged down by accidentally being easy. I must say though, it's got one of the best boss themes in the game. Like, just take a listen for yourself. It's, 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 a, it's a plant. Gelgabalm is pretty much the Biscarsh of Door to Phantomile. Third boss, you have to hit it from above and it is used by the villain to get info. However, I like this boss a lot more than Biscarsh because you can actually hit the boss. It is timing based similar to Rongolango, so it can be tricky. It will also sprout a seed that turns into a spike ball that you'll need to jump over. It will also jump in an attempt to land on you, but you can use it to your advantage by having it be near a spring so when it lands you can bounce on the spring and hit it. Later on it gets red and its attacks become more potent. The attacks can make this boss a little repetitive if they do the same ones over and over. Also once you do get the timing right it does become a little easy. Like. It's a boss from Door of the Phantom Isle, what do you expect? However, I am surprised by how not terrible this boss fight was, despite it being kinda easy. <laughs> to be honest, despite being one of the better bosses in Door of the Phantom Isle, I have very mixed feelings about Nahatu. In fact, he might be pretty mid. <laughs> On one hand, he has a lot of stuff that makes him a great final boss. Then again, there is also stuff that makes him not as good as the later bosses on this list. The first phase has you shooting moves at the cannon so they all fire at him simultaneously. When that's complete, Nahatu will inhale you and you fight him on the inside. The second phase has you grabbing and throwing moves and hitting these four crystals and then one big crystal you have to hit twice. Once you complete that, the platform breaks and you'll be spat out and Dry Nahatum is revealed. The final phase brings you back to the arena and now they're platforms, so you need to time the shots with a double jump to get them in the cannons. Phase 1 isn't really that difficult since you can clear it by using the armored moves when Nahatum uses the slam attack to break the armor. But there is this near impossible to dodge tongue attack which can make it more annoying to give ammo. Phase 2 is probably the worst phase because the platform is slippery and it's toppling. And on top of that, Nahatum is firing laser eyes at you. It's basically trying to keep you on your toes, but it makes the phase a lot more annoying than it is. Phase 3 is the best phase mainly because it also keeps you on your toes, but it's not as annoying as the second phase. Nahatum will inhale platforms, use the rainbow circle, and he fires out an armored move that runs along the platforms. The only bad thing is that this phase can easily drag out with all of this combined, especially since it's a lot more finicky to time the shots. 
This was a decent at best final boss, and it was satisfying to see Klonoa absolutely freaking decimate Nahatoom with the final shot. Just like that, the role of final boss is fulfilled. It's not like the saddest ending in gaming happens afterwards, yeah. It's also not like he comes back later as a playable character in the spin-off game. Also a final boss whose ending is that his hotel bombs because his mascot is a yossified version of himself. What am I talking about again? Oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, on to the next one. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I actually really like Gaudius. He is probably the best Dark Spirit character I've ever seen in fiction. He actually has a motivation for destroying the world with his spore maid Patrick over here. He basically was rejected by Phantom Isle for being a king of nightmares. Therefore, he takes revenge on the world for rejecting and abandoning him. He doesn't even care if he's destroyed as well. He's lived a millennia of isolation. So he is willing to die just to see all of Phantom Isle eviscerated by bootleg Barney over here. However, we can't let him destroy the world, so we have to fight him. You go in a wheel-like arena with these three yellow orbs that can teleport you out of the arena if touched, where Gaudius sends shockwaves to hit you and knock you off the arena. The first attack has him raining down moves you can grab and throw at him. The second one has him send three lines of moves, grab all of them per line, and the yellow orbs will reveal. The final attack has him make a triangle he slams into the arena. I also like to call this attack the Rowie Go attack. Shoot the orbs to release the moves so you can grab them. Once you drain his health, he's down for the count. My big issue with the fight is mainly where the placement is. It doesn't help with the fact that the wheel you find him in is constantly moving. It isn't too annoying if you just keep moving and jumping. Overall, it's a fine and kind of easy boss fight for a character who is actually well written, despite the fact he has next to no screen time. Kind of sad that he never shows up in any other game besides this one. It really boils down to cameos and every time Door to Phantom Isle is remade, which is like twice right now. Yeah, 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 it's pretty sad for my favorite, uh, spoopy boy. I'm a funny guy just because I'm dressed like a clown? I suppose you think I shouldn't have a gun either! I like that Joker has an excellent build-up to his own actual fight. From what everybody thought was going to be another comedic side villain, to the grandpa gunning force to be reckoned with we see him as later on. Now it's finally time to fight him and his boss fight is actually great and actually the best boss in Door to Phantom Isle, don't at me. This is the exact reason why I rank him above Gaudius. That and he has way more of a story presence than Gaudius, so uh, yeah. And by story presence, I mean screen time. At first glance, this looks easy. His powers of darkness is him walking aimlessly across the arena. However, there is a catch to this. His hands are spinning which can deflect your shots, adding the fact that he is also moving around makes it more tricky to hit him. Add that to this boss also uses the day and night mechanic from the level he's on, where Joker will transform into a monster and you have to clear the color tiles back to yellow to revert back to day. The moves in the arena will also become invulnerable so you have to look out for them. You also have Joker's slam and spin attacks you need to dodge. This part does manage to keep you on your toes without needing to juggle a bunch of different attacks. Joker can also jump when his health is lower, but you'll notice it right away so there is no need to worry about missing shots. To conclude, an awesome boss for an awesome villain that goes out in an awesome way. When you first meet the King of Sorrow, he leaves an outstanding first impression. There is even foreshadowing in the form of him calling out to Klonoa for help throughout the game. From a story perspective, he is fantastic. He is being outcasted by society for representing Sorrow. The kingdoms of Lunateo refuse to accept Sorrow as a part of themselves, since everyone is too caught up with their lives. The king has isolated himself because of this and has cried for years. As Leona puts it, a mass of pure sorrow. Klonoa understands this because he himself has experienced sorrow, and he helps him out by ringing the bell of sorrow and telling him that people will accept sorrow and he doesn't need to isolate himself anymore, and he'll finally be at peace. The king accepts this and finally dies. 
in Klonoa's arms. Actually, he does reincarnate to a baby according to this picture in the credits. It's still actually a very beautiful cutscene with his main theme playing in the background. And it really helps out, because it's one of my favorite songs in the game, honestly. As Leorna puts it, a picture-perfect moment. Hmm, that's odd. How could a character such as Leorna be so freaking BASED? Um, what, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I need to talk about his boss fight, yeah. As a boss, he is actually pretty good. I like him a lot more than not to. The first phase tests you on your skills with the hoverboard where you pick up these weird moves and fight a monster that takes the form of Baguji, I think, I don't know. It does really rely more on timing, which is a little annoying since it kind of becomes a waiting game. However, the second phase really picks up the pace, where, you, where he forms a giant force field with these weird bubbles you have to hit. You hit them by grabbing these claws he sends out and hit the shield pimples. They do sprout these lasers which can hurt you, which is a little bit confusing, but once you figured it out, you'll do all right. Once you get rid of those, two more will appear and you have to hit those to win. This boss does manage to keep you on your toes without doing too much. Take notes, Natum, you'll need it for your makeup quiz. Overall, this boss fight is actually a good final boss that does challenge you without frustrating or annoying you. And there is some beefy lore to go along with it as well, like, why is this character so well written? Give me the plan. <laughs> yes, people, there is, in fact, a second plant-looking boss in Glanoa. His name is Lepita, I mean Leptio, Lepita, Lepita, Leprosy. What may be considered as another lame boss monster actually becomes a fun boss. He'll split himself in four, and you have to throw a moon to make him start rolling. He progressively ramps up more in speed as you hit him, and he'll eventually slow down. My only problem with this phase is that there is no distinction when he clones himself, so hitting him can be trial and error. Also, the rolling part, I don't know if that's depending on the placement of the moves. Like, that's probably where I get a little annoyed with the fight. I guess I don't know. It's not that big of a deal. The second phase is where he pulls out the spike barrier, which you have to throw in order to knock him over. Then you have to throw move forwards when he is revealed on the inside and knock him off. He does move when knocked over, so grabbing and or throwing moves can be a little tricky. This is actually a tricky yet fun boss to cap off a pretty fun world. Also, he is voiced by the same guy who voices Donkey Kong and Ganon. Of the glorious fruit of the noble hen, eggs, eggs. Like Veladium, Palonte the Hatchling is a boss that is a turning point for the story. Except for the fact that the boss is actually fun and somewhat challenging. This boss also uses the surfboard, and honestly, it does it way better than the King of Sorrow. The first phase basically has you to rely on the boost pads to hit him mainly due to Lolo losing her will to help Klonoa out because this brutally honest tree called her out on not wanting to save the world. You also have these obstacles to avoid which can decrease your speed. Once the first phase is done, Popka being the biggest chad in the series he is, gives Lolo a pet talk on moving forward through thick and thin. It's actually a pretty good speech that relays a message that no matter what, we have to keep moving forward even if we doubt ourselves. This gives Lolo the motivation to help Klonoa out and the second second phase begin. It's similar to the first phase, but once you reach him, he sends out these moves you can grab and throw at him. My only problem with this fight is that he gives out these moves like candy, and sometimes the boost bubbles don't exactly register like they should. Aside from that, this boss fight is actually great, and is the point where Lolo's character begins to develop. Wait, this isn't even number one on the ranking, isn't it? No. Look, I may have given Joka a ton of praise a few segments ago, but Leorna is my favorite character in the series. I like her design, her personality, and how she does everything in her power to get what she wants. We even get to see her motivations, and how impatient and dissatisfied she is in her position as a priestess or savior. So give her an excellent boss fight to coincide with that? Yes siree, Karma has come to bite her badly as the sorrow overtakes her and she becomes Cursed Leorna. The first phase consists of you using the lightning moves to hit her belly. She also jumps on you, so you have to push back and hit her with the lightning move. 
she'll also jump up in the air and charge up a shockwave attack, so you need to reach up and hit her. This may be a me thing, but I always had trouble with hitting her while she was jumping. I don't know, maybe it's something about timing. Man, all these bosses are timing based. Anyway, the second phase has her under the arena where you need to hit the ball thing and throw moves on these platforms to hit her underneath. Do that enough times and she'll change colors and repeat phase one's attack. That is really my only problem with the fight. She gets this cooler, awesome look and just goes back to the drawing board. When you beat her, however, that's just the cherry on top. Leorna comes clean with Klonoa and the gang. All that she's done was just so she could prove herself as a savior, a motive similar to Lolo's. She looks back on her actions and she realizes power can't overcome sorrow. It brings nothing but pain and suffering to others. This is another turning point boss fight, except it's kickstarting Leorna working her way towards redemption. She allows the gang to save the world, saying that they're ready. She even helps them out at the end and rebuilds the Kingdom of Sorrow. An overall perfect conclusion for her character. And this cutscene also shows that Tat is a 2 out of 10 character and not a 1 out of 10 character. Well, that's gonna do it for this ranking video. This has actually been a pretty hard video to make. It wasn't easy having to rank all these bosses best to worst. This was the one that won a poll on my community tab, so I needed to fulfill my duty as a man of the people. I actually should make more actual gaming content and not just cartoons and a history lesson on two significant games I never played. Thanks for watching, everybody. And remember, they had the nerve to bring back Nod to him in Beach Volleyball. In this form, no less.